All right, it is 11 o'clock. So um, I guess we'll go ahead and get started. Um, okay. CEO everyone. My name is uh, Abraham Bearpaw and I wanna welcome you to Cherokee Leadership Style from Ancient to Modern. Um, today's presentation is a part of our weekly uh, series on Thursdays. This is organized by uh, Donnie Saloli, our cultural outreach officer. And uh, so every Thursday you can look forward to a presentation. Um, I believe she has put that schedule out, but um, if not, um, at the end we can uh, let you know where to find that schedule because it's full of some really awesome um, presentations on culture, um, government, and also sustainability um, for your organizations. So uh, have, a, have a lot of um, great content to look forward to. Um, you know, once again, um, I see some more people are joining on. I just wanna say, um, I really appreciate you guys taking the time um, to join us today for this presentation. Um, so we'll go ahead and get started. Maybe. Okay, there we go. Uh, a little bit about myself. My name is Abraham Bearpaw. I am the Special Projects Officer for Cherokee Nation Community and Cultural Outreach. I am, I just started in this position um, going on a month now. Uh, before that, I worked, I lived in California and I worked for the uh, Torres Martinez tribe, uh, part of their tribal TANF program. And I was the Family Perseverance Manager um, most recently, but I also held the position of uh, cultural specialist, um, youth specialist. So I held um, several different um, positions for them and they were um, an outstanding tribe to work for. Work for. Um, they're out in the desert down there. That took a little getting used to, um, but um, no, it was, it was a great experience. I'm an author also. I um, co-authored the book, Cherokee Wisdom, 12 Lessons for Becoming a Powerful Leader. That was with uh, Cynthia Ruiz, was my co-author. Um, a lot of you may be familiar with her. Um, she runs the Chalagi Los Angeles um, group out in California. I'm a motivational speaker and a cultural preservation activist. Um, I began motivational speaking probably about five years ago. Um, I was never one really to speak out. Uh, you know, I remember whenever I was young, uh, some people who would visit our family from out of state used to actually try and pay me dollars to speak because that's how much like you just, I didn't open my mouth. And so, um, you know, I kind of got into this role because um, as many of you may know, I'm in recovery. I have over eight years of sobriety. I am a recovering alcoholic. And so, you know, I just felt like uh, I needed to speak out because a lot of people couldn't. And I felt like the message that I had about turkey culture and about recovery was one that, that could help a lot of people. And I believe it has, you know, throughout this time um, doing motivational speaking and things. I've worked with um, a lot of different Native families. Well, not just um, Native, but a lot of families. And uh, it's been a very rewarding experience. So I'm just excited to share the message that, you know what, um, you know, you may have to deal with some of these things, but, um, you know, there are brighter days ahead. And if you work hard, you're, you're going to be able to overcome it, anything. Um, but like I said, my passion is teaching Cherokee. Turkey culture to families. I, um, you know, it's it's very rewarding. Uh, we have a, we have a great time always. You know, we do stick ball, um, teach about some of our, our ceremonies, uh, teach about language, and so uh, you know, it's just really awesome to see our to participants when they they get to learn a little bit about their own culture and heritage. Um, you know, how much it begins to um, transform their lives. Um, I do this because I believe everything we need we can find in our cultural teachings. And we're gonna go through some of those today. And by following our original ways, uh, we can learn to walk in balance. Um, what I mean by walking in balance is that, you know, we have harmony in our lives. Um, you know, I used to be a workaholic and I thought that was really good. You know, I, I was being a, a, you know, a go-getter. I was out there and all I did was work. And I would get burned out and I would get tired. And, you know, it, it affected my relationships. Um, I wasn't eating well. I didn't have time to exercise. It began to affect my health. 
So, you know, part of walking in balance is just making sure that we don't go too much into one area of our life and we're able to bring all of those areas together um, so that, you know, we can be in harmony. So that's a lot about myself. Um, I just want to say, uh, first and foremost, uh, Wado, for all that you do, um, all of you out there, you know, whether you're part of a Cherokee community organization, an at-large community, whether you're on reservation, uh, you know, during this pandemic, it's been very challenging. Uh, but I've seen on social media, you know, all the work that you're doing for each other, for your families, for our tribe. Uh, you know, a lot of people have had to work during this whole time. You know, I know our, our healthcare workers, you know, our frontline workers, uh, you know, and I just really appreciate all of you. You know, you've had to take on different roles, um, you know, with your children being home, you know, and, you know, maybe not being able to see family. You know, it's, it's just been very challenging. You know, but as we sit now, we can start to see the light at the end of the tunnel. And that's because of all of you. That's because of all of the work that you um, put in every day. Um, and Cherokees have not always had a centralized government to protect our affairs. During times of transition, it was the community leaders that held our people together. Uh, you know, we now, nowadays, we really enjoy, uh, you know, a very strong government. Um, our tribal council, um, our chief, uh, principal chief, deputy chief, you know, our leaders and administration, you know, really set a, a good course um, for our people. And so, you know, we can be very thankful about that. But there were a lot of times when, you know, United States, you know, during removal, during, you know, all of these really bad policies that they had, you know, towards our people, um, it was a chaotic time. And we didn't always have that really strong you know, centralized government, you know, to hold us all together. It was all of the people. And so, um, you know, I just really appreciate you guys are continuing, you know, in that spirit. And um, it's just really, um, really awesome to see. <clears throat> Cherokee community organizations provide a strong foundation for our people. What you all do is a big deal and it's very much appreciated. So like I said, whether you're on reservation or, you know, at large, um, you know, I see on social media, it's just really awesome to see all the events that you're putting on, uh, you know, and all the things that you're able to do, you know, to help our tribal citizens out. I really believe in our people helping our people. Um, I stole that uh, slogan uh, from the last place I worked for. That's their, their slogan. But, um, you know, I really believe in it. It's just, you know, um, you know when, when Cherokees get out and help Cherokees, it's so beneficial because we know what we need. You know, we know it is needed in our communities, in our families. And so by us being able to get out in the community, uh, being in the forefront, um, taking on those leadership roles, it really cuts out, you know, a lot of the time, bureaucracy and everything else if we were dealing with the federal government or these kind of things. You know, by you having these community organizations, it, it just really helps to support, you know, not only our people, but our tribal government, you know, because they can't be everywhere at all times. You know, it's up to us, you know, to do a lot of the work also. And you guys are, are doing a tremendous job of that. <clears throat> Cherokee community organizations provide access to culture and essential services, provide a sense of community for our tribal members. I know this is true because, um, like I said, I just moved from California. Um, I was an at-large citizen. And a lot of times I felt disconnected from our tribe. Um, you know, there aren't no stomp dances out there. You know, there aren't a whole lot of groups, um, you know, getting together, play stickball, but the local groups in, in our area were very active. And so I was really blessed to, to be a part of their, their activities. And it re really made me feel like, um, you know, I belonged somewhere, even though I was hundreds of miles away from home. So unity among our people is important. We must not be like crabs in a bucket. Um, for some of you who saw my presentation um, at the last conference we had, um, I told this story, um, I tell it a lot because it really um, impacted me when I heard it. I went to, probably about four years ago now, down on the Rincon Reservation in Southern California. I was able to go to a training down there and uh, the trainer, he was a Caucasian guy. He said that uh, natives are like crabs in a bucket. You know, you don't have to put a, a lid on crabs when you have them in a bucket because when one tries to get up and get out, another crab will always grab it and pull it back down. He said, that's how natives are. And at the time, it really made me mad, um, you know, because that's not how I saw our people. 
you know, I didn't see us, um, you know, doing that. And I really had to take a look at myself because um, I began to see that in myself, you know, on social media, uh, you know, if somebody was doing something, say, oh, you know, they're not doing it right. Or, oh, they're not speaking the, the language correctly. Or, oh, that ceremony's wrong or, or these kind of things. And instead of saying, hey, you know, they look like they, they could use some help. Let me see how I can help them. Let me see how I can, you know, go and organize volunteers for them. Or, you know, maybe just make some suggestions. So it really transformed how I interacted with people on social media. Uh, never again, uh, you know, am I to get on there and, you know, um, talk about what anybody's doing. If somebody's doing something good in our communities or in any community, it's, it's my responsibility to get up there, um, you know, say good things, be supportive, pray for them, and then see how I can help. You know, I don't need my name out there just seeing, hey, message the person, hey, could you use this or that? Or, you know, is there, there any way I can help you out? That's how we have to support each other on social media to make sure that we're, we're not like that. We're not dragging each other down. Um, you know, jealousy, um, all of these things, uh, you know, resentment. Um, those are things I've had to work on myself. So that's how I know they exist. And, you know, now it's just really fulfilling to, to be able to be a part of the solution than be a part of the problem. Um, you know, before in the past, I didn't always feel like, you know, maybe people were speaking for me, you know, who are a part of the tribe. So instead of being negative and all of these things, you know, I decided to be a part of the solution, you know, be positive. And so it's just really paid off in my life. And, um, you know, hopefully I've been able to help. And so, um, you know, if you guys ever need help with anything, you know, don't be afraid of, oh, I'm not doing it this way, you know, this right or that right or whatever. As long as you're trying, you're getting out there and you're trying, that's all that matters. That's 100% of it right there. And so, you know, as the rest of us as Cherokee people, we need to get out there and support you and say, hey, you know, what is it that you need? Do um, you need cultural expertise? Do you need somebody to pick up trash? You know, whatever it is, um, you know, you guys do the work and um, we'll get out there and support you. So, you know, like I said, this presentation is on Cherokee leadership. Um, and so we're going to explore two questions. What style of leadership is most successful for Cherokee people? And what can leaders do to ensure that they have legitimacy? So, you know, I'm not a historian. We're not going to go through, you know, year by year, leader by leader, um, what they did right, what they did wrong, um, things like that. We're going to talk more in a generalized um, form of, you know, what style of leadership has worked for Cherokees in the past? and what style of leadership continues to work for us to this day. Um, also, we're going to uh, talk about how our leaders can ensure that they have legitimacy. And why is this important? Well, you know, our leadership structure isn't built in a way that is like, you know, uh, oh, you do this or, you know, you know, you're gonna have these consequences. We really, the way that Cherokees lead is we lead by example. You know, and if nobody's, you know, going to follow us, if we don't have anybody who's, who believes in us, then we're not going to get anywhere. We may have the best ideas in the world, but if people don't believe in you or believe in what you're doing, then you're not going to get very far. And so I've learned, you know, that, you know, of course, you know, the hard way. I always had, um, you know, what I thought were really good ideas, but I wasn't living my, my life in a way that inspired other people, um, you know, and I had to learn a lot, learn how to bring other people in, how to be inclusive, and um, how to listen to people I didn't dis who I disagreed with. You know, people I disagree with have some of the best ideas. And by putting resentment away, you know, it just opened me up to a whole new um, talent pool, you know, and then, you know, to where, you know, people's experiences, you know, I, I could draw on and their wisdom, you know. So it's just really awesome if you don't keep yourself closed off and you know you live in a way that that inspires people but it's a you know it's a it's a process you can't just do this you know overnight you know saying well you know i'm going to go from one way to being another way you can make the decision to change but it takes some work so but the one thing you know i, I will tell you is that it's awesome because it's possible and so um, i'm going to show you some of the steps um, if you're having trouble in some of those areas uh, what you can do about it. So talk about, 
uh, pre-contact Cherokee leadership. Um, you know, before pre-contact, political power among the Cherokee was decentralized and towns acted autonomously. So we didn't have, uh, back then, uh, you know, a principal chief. Um, you know, each of our towns, um, you know, they had their own leaders, you know, and, and they did what they want, you know, um, they conducted their affairs how they saw fit. In 1735, our people were estimated to have existed in 64 towns and villages. Before 1794, um, like I said, the Cherokees had no standing national government. Our leadership structure was based on clans and towns which had various leaders and the clans had functions within each town and tribe. So, um, you know, what, what we're gonna look at, like I said, I'm, I'm not a historian. We're not gonna go through, um, you know, all of our history. Um, but we're gonna talk about what has, you know, along with, you know, um, pre-contact, post-contact, um, our culture, what has shaped our leadership style throughout the years? Um, that's what we're gonna focus on. So what attributes were leaders expected to possess during this time? So, you know, a long time ago, um, you know, we, we have to think about what life was, was like back then. Um, how were our leaders chosen? Um, you know, these kind of things. So, you know, a lot of times, you know, like I said, just as now, people had to believe in you. You couldn't just be, you know, you couldn't have all these negative um, attributes and then expect to be called on, you know, to be a leader in your tribe. And the times, you know, make the leader. You know, I know a lot of leaders who have no interest in being in a leadership position, no interest in politics, no interest in being the director, no interest in any of that. But they had a, an awesome skill set. They had an awesome way with people. They had awesome ideas. And so it wasn't, it isn't this love of power that drives our people. It's the love of, of our people and, and seeing how we can help them in a good way. That's what um, leadership was all about. So here are some of the attributes uh, that we're going to talk about. And so, you know, the first one, of course, um, listening. Uh, empathy, healing, awareness, persuasion, conceptualization, foresight, stewardship, commitment to the growth of people, and building community. So a lot of these may look familiar from my, uh, you know, previous uh, presentation that I did at the conference, if you guys were watching. And the reason they are familiar is because they are the 10 key servant leader traits, according to the Robert K. Greenleaf Center for Servant Leadership. So as many of you know, uh, my last presentation was on servant leadership. So how can we know that these attributes were important, um, you know, pre-contact in our tribal towns, um, in our families? How can we know that these are the, the attributes that we look for in our leaders? One of the ways is because these, each of these attributes is found in Cherokee culture to this day. Cherokee culture emphasizes and teaches each of these attributes. That's how we can know they were important then is because our culture has survived to this day and each of these attributes is still emphasized um, in our culture. And, you know, as we look to our leaders now, uh, you know, I look on social media, uh, you know, we just had two days ago, you know, they opened up. So you could go and get your packets if you're running for, you know, tribal council. And I've already seen on social media, uh, you know, people will say, hey, I'm running. I got my packet. And people are already blowing them up. Well, you know, making sure they're going to listen, making sure they're empathetic. How are you going to heal us? You know, um, talking about persuasion. You know, how are you going to get people together? Asking them about, you know, conceptualization. Can they form these ideas? What foresight do you have? How are you know? Uh, are you going to be a good steward for our people? Are you committed to the growth of our people? And how are you going to build our communities? So it's uh, you know this list has a, you know is maybe new, you know it may have a new name, servant leadership, but this concept has existed, um, you know for for many 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 years, um, you know for the Cherokee people, and so you can see our leaders being held accountable. Our our Cherokee people still expect this stuff. When you, you know, you get on there and you announce, say, hey, I'm going to be a leader. Um, you can expect that people are going to hold you accountable. And these are the things that people are asking about. 
And so it's just really awesome to see um, not only that, um, you know, people are stepping up to be involved, you know, to be leaders for our tribe and, you know, leaders for our community organizations, but also that, you know, all of these concepts and attributes are alive and well. Uh, you know, we haven't lost sight of what is really important for the Cherokee people because, you know, um, we're holding each other accountable. And, um, you know, our leaders are, you know, we have high expectations for them. And, um, you know, that's really awesome to see. Um, you know, I really, like I said, you know, we really um, are blessed, you know, with, with uh, a lot of great leaders um, who are steering our tribe in a really good direction. And so it's just really awesome to see all of these things um, in action. And like I said, the reason we know uh, that all of these um, attributes were expected out of our leaders is because Cherokee com culture promotes all of these traits um, in our people still to this day. <clears throat> so another one of the cultural aspects that I believe helped shape our leadership style is that Cherokee society was historically a matrilineal uh, matriarchal society. And that's still true to this day. This means clanship was attained through the mother and hereditary leadership and property were passed to the maternal line. Traditionally, women were considered head of the household among Cherokees, with the home and children uh, belonging to her should she separate from a husband, and maternal uncles were considered more important than fathers. In addition, Cherokee society tended to be matrilocal, meaning that once married, a couple moved in with or near the bride's family. Women also held various leadership positions in the tribal town as well. Uh, so the reason I believe that this has helped shape our leadership style so much is because, you know, by women being in, you know, you don't see it now that you're just now starting to see women in, in leadership positions throughout the United States, um, you know, and elsewhere. But this is not a new concept for Cherokee people. Uh, Pre-contact, um, women and men, we, we uh, led together and it created a balance. It created a harmony. And so that's why I think that by men and women working together, um, no one above the other, uh, it helped our people to be in harmony and to be in balance. Um, you know, and so, um, you know, like I said, this, a lot of this still, uh, you know, these cultural aspects, um, they still exist to this day. So, you know, uh, when we talk about, you know, um, all of these concepts, you know, sometimes it's like, oh, a long time ago, this is the way it was. But I want to talk a little bit about my family leadership so that I can show you that these concepts, a lot of these concepts um, are still a part of our culture and are still our practice to this day, even though there might not be a name for them, you know, in English. And, um, you know, it's just still, a, you know, our culture is alive and well. So in my family, uh, my grandmother was the head of our family. Um, my mother's brothers were responsible for my um, upbringing and cultural teaching. So, you know, just like a long time ago where it was your mom's brothers, you know, were often closer to the kids than the, the father was, you know, then there were several reasons for this, uh, you know, because of war, because of other things, you know, and, and for me, you know, um, when my, my dad wasn't able to be around, you know, I had all of these uncles and um, each of them, you know, took time teaching me, you know, different things, um, what they had learned in all of this. And so, um, you know, this, like I said, in my life, um, this is still, you know, true to this day. And now I'm going to do my best to, um, you know, make sure that my sister's kids, I pass down what I learned from my uncles um, to them and so on and so on. And, and we'll keep it going, um, you know, but I think that, you know, this is a really uh, sacred relationship, you know, with your uncle um, or your, your aunts also, um, you know, because I, I learned so much from them. And so um, it was just really awesome, you know, to have them be a, a big part of my life and to teach me so much. When I married, I moved in with my wife and her family. Um, nobody ever said anything. It was just expected. And so, um, you know, I, I, like I said, I, I moved in with their family and, um, you know, it, it was a really awesome experience. Um, one thing I didn't put in the PowerPoint, um, when I divorced, they moved me right out. And so that was a, 
you know, kind of a traditional thing too, a long time ago, you know, if you, one of the ways you got divorced was, uh, you know, the wife would put your stuff outside and that was kind of your sign to hit the road, Jack. So, um, you know, but, um, so yeah, so these are some of the, you know, the, the cultural aspects, you know, that still exist to this day. Um, you know, as far as matriarchy and, um, you know, receiving your clan, you know, uh, and teachings, you know, through your mother's life. While there have been some changes um, to our family dynamics due to European American influence, many customs and cultural teachings still apply. Um, you know, and that, that's really awesome. You know, really awesome to see that, you know, a lot of our ways, uh, you know, are still here. And it's really awesome to see all of you out there on social media, um, you know, practicing your culture every day, you know, and sharing that with one another. So now we're going to talk about post-contact Cherokee leadership. So, you know, as many of you know, uh, many years after contact were marked by war, broken treaties, and ultimately forced removal. These times of adversity put much stress on our leadership and threatened our way of life. U.S. government polluted our leadership structure. Um, you know, and one of those ways was by, um, you know, you no longer saw women getting a seat at the table, um, you know, especially when dealing with the United States a lot of times. You know, they just dealt with men, which takes, you know, half of our people totally out of the equation of being able to contribute. And so it just means that you're going to be less effective. I mean, that's just math, you know. And so um, also assimilation policy sought to destroy Turkey culture. And due to patriarchal views held by colonizers, women held fewer leadership roles. So, um, you know, like I said, that was, you know, on our leadership structure, you know, those attacks, you know, and we also had attacks on our family, attacks on our culture. However, through all of the upheaval and adversity, our people persevered. We could not be destroyed because our leaders were all of the people. And this goes back to pre-contact when we're talking about not having a centralized government. You know, we had all of these towns that acted autonomously, all of these families that acted autonomously. That means we had leaders really throughout our whole people. And, um, you know, still to this day, you see that. And so I believe that contributed, you know, to our success and being able to persevere was that, you know, we didn't have a, a small handful of leaders. You know, we had a whole, a whole tribe of leaders. So, um, you know, and then once you saw after removal, our families began to help one another and small communities began to form, you know, and you can see history of, through that, history of that, um, you know, throughout Northeast Oklahoma. And elsewhere, you know, just uh, and I, I think back sometimes when I'm driving or I'm walking out in the woods, and just think back the strength of of our people who you know came to this land and um, you know had next to nothing, um, you know, but Cherokee spirit, you know, a willingness to work together and willingness to help each other, um, and now look, you know, what our, our reservation has turned into, and you know, everything that we, you know, sometimes take for granted. I do. Um, but I'm just really thankful, you know, for their strength and their, their willingness to, to help each other out. And recently, after we began to hold our own elections, um, Cherokee servant leaders emerged onto the political scene, including women who were previously shut out of the political process. And so, you know, I'm talking about, you know, uh, 1970s or so, you know, to present, uh, when we began to hold our own elections again, you know, because there was a time when the United States would just appoint a chief, you know, for a day, sign this paper, you know, or, or, or things like that. Um, you know, for us to be able to have that political power um, has really helped us, you know, to, to make sure that we have a seat, you know, at the table. And then, you know, now look, you know, um, where we are on the cusp of having a delegate, you know, um, sent to Congress. And so, you know, talking about, uh, you know, really uh, our influence, you know, has really uh, been transformed um, by our leaders, you know, just, just trudging along and persevering, you know, um, through all of this adversity. Um, it's just really awesome to see now, you know, and not only, uh, not only that, but to see all of the, the women now who are in leadership positions, leadership roles. And this just reinforces, it goes back to what I was talking about, balance and harmony. We cannot be in balance if men and women are not working together. 
if we do not, um, you know, each hold up our, our end of the bargain, um, you know, that's what's going to help us also, you know, as a people to continue to be in balance um, if we have our men and our women uh, working together. So Cherokee leadership, like I said, remains strong because of you. Our people have always been the source of our strength. Um, and, you know, it's still true to this day. You know, if you look, like I said, our, our tribal administration, they cannot be everywhere. Uh, you know, um, and so it's, it's all of you who are doing, you know, a lot of the work to make these things happen in the community. And so, um, yeah, I'm amazed by it. Um, I'm appreciative of it. Um, I just think it's awesome. You know, not just, you know, our, our CCOs, but in our families, you know, uh, you know, right now our moms and dads holding our families together, our grandmas and grandpas, once again, you know, our, our tribe has been called on um, during a, a real time ad adversity to, to help each other out, to, to um, adapt. And, you know, once again, uh, our tribe is answering the call. And so um, that is, you know, that is how you can, you know, really see um, servant leadership has been a, a huge part, uh, you know, of the dynamics of our leadership you know, for our tribe throughout the years, because, um, you know, our leaders are expected to get out there and do the work. Um, they're expected to serve. And like I said, you know, a long time ago, you know, uh, there wasn't that the fancy name for it, but, um, you know, in, in Cherokee, we have words for it. And, you know, it's getting together and, and you know, helping each other. Um, you know, Godugi's one, you know, um, thing that comes to mind when we talk about helping each other out. And so, um, you know, like um, you can see there on the screen, um, servant leadership is a philosophy in which the main goal of the leader is to serve. Servant leader shares power, puts the needs of the team first, and it helps people develop and perform as highly as possible. So, you know, one of the reasons it is important to, um, you know, to help those around us is because even though we are leaders, you know, there's only so much we can do by ourselves. If we don't have that team around us who believe in us and who are willing to, to put it on the line also, you're not going to be as effective as you could be. So some of the places that you can see servant leadership still active in our Cherokee communities, our chief and councils, um, who you see out there. Uh, you know, I see the chief out there um, a lot, um, you know, handing out food, uh, you know, helping people, um, coming up with new ideas. Um, fighting for our people and, you know, our tribal council as well, uh, you know, getting out there and, and being among the people and serving our people. And so that's what I'm talking about. And it's really awesome. But not just our chief and councils, our stomp ground leaders, uh, you know, who guide us in our spiritual teachings, uh, you know, and who teach many of these things. Uh, many of these, uh, our values, you know, come, come from our stomp grounds. Um, and now our language preservation specialists. You know, these, these men and women are so important because, you know, uh, they get out there every day to make sure that our language is surviving and thriving. And it is hard work. And, you know, our language program has been built up to now you can see, you know, they just um, dedicated that new facility, um, you know, named after a, a tremendous human being, a tremendous Cherokee. And so, you know, um, it's just really awesome to see how far, uh, you know, our language programs have come. And it makes me excited for the future, you know, to um, once again be able to, to hear kids running around speaking um, to each other in Cherokee. Um, it's just really awesome. And our, all of you, our community organizational leaders, um, you know, all of you guys are out there, you know, uh, bearing the brunt of it, uh, doing the hard work, you know, and, you know, one thing I will also say about all of you guys is you don't always get a bat, pat on the back for it. Uh, you know, uh, see a little bit on social media, you know, some people will, um, you know, praise you guys, you know, and, and give you thanks. But, you know, a lot of times it's a thankless job. You guys do it because you believe in our communities. You see what needs um, to be done. You see where the needs are and you get out there and do it. And, uh, you know, I'm just really impressed by that. And uh, like I said, I'm really thankful for it. And also, um, once again, our family leaders, 
you know, not just talking about also our moms and dads, but our big brothers, our big sisters, uh, you know, um, siblings or aunts and uncles. Uh, you know, somebody is always, you know, looking up to you, no matter who you are. Somebody's always going to be looking up to you, uh, you know, for guidance. And, uh, you know, so it's up to us to make sure we're setting a, a good example. So when we talk about servant leadership, um, you know, one of the things I believe is uh, of utmost importance is that our servant leaders learn to walk in balance. Um, so walking in balance means that we find harmony between our mind, body, and spirit so that we can live well. So, um, you know, and we must do this because servant leaders, like I said, need to have that legitimacy. Um, it doesn't matter, you know, if we have the best ideas in the world, if people don't believe in us, if they can't take us at our word, um, you know, and if they don't feel that we have their best interests at heart, um, they're not going to buy into, you know, what we're saying. So people need to believe in you and what you're trying to accomplish, um, you know, for the, for these things to work. Um, let's see. So when we're talking about walking in balance, um, what does that mean? So, uh, you know, there are many different um, aspects to walking in balance, but I've uh, narrowed it down, uh, you know, to these several, and I believe that it begins, it all starts with gratitude. Uh, you know, that's one of the things, um, aspects of Cherokee life, um, you know, I think is one of, is of utmost importance. You know, if you look around, you know, it doesn't matter what Cherokee people are doing. We are always grateful for the things that the Creator has blessed us with. We're always grateful for each other. And so, um, you know, it really is the bedrock of our strength as a people, you know. So um, we need to have, you know, make sure we have that gratitude. And how do you practice gratitude? Um, you know, for me, it starts every day. I um, say a prayer, you know, to the Creator. I give thanks to the Creator, um, you know, every day when I wake up. I'm thankful to our ancestors who have walked before us, uh, who have set a, a really good course for us to follow, who made sure that we have our, our traditions, our ceremonies, our language. Um, you know, all of these things uh, I'm just truly grateful for. So I start that way in the morning. Um, I braid, braid my hair. Um, you know, and when I'm braiding my hair or getting my hair braided, um, you know, I'm always doing it with good thoughts in mind. You know, because that, you know, is being woven in you know, is being woven into me, you know, as my hair is being braided, those good thoughts are being woven in and sets the tone for my day. Uh, spiritual wellness, you know, like I said, uh, you know, being in, in, in touch with the creator, being in touch with our environment, being in touch with each other, you know, that's what, you know, is, is really important, you know, as, as far as us maintaining, um, you know, a, a strong spiritual connection. Um, emotional wellness, mental wellness, physical wellness, and social wellness. So I know this is a lot of wellness there, um, but the reason each of these are important is because this is what creates the balance in our life. Like I said before, you know, whenever I was younger, I was a workaholic, and I thought, you know, I was doing a really good job, and I was really proud of myself, and I was, um, once somebody told me, um, an elder, don't burn the candle at both ends. And, you know, when you're young, you, you know, shoot, I could work all night. I work graveyard shift too. I'd work seven at night to seven in the morning, get up, um, you know, help cook my kids breakfast and then, um, you know, grab a couple hours sleep and um, try to study for school. And then I was back at work. And so, you know, I was just burning myself out. You know, when you're younger, you don't notice as much. If I tried to do that now, I would notice really quick uh, because, you know, I don't have the same stamina that I used to have, but, um, you know, you have, we have to make sure that, you know, everything is in balance. So when we're talking about our emotions, one of the biggest things that I bring up when I'm, whenever I'm teaching the youth is being able to talk about our emotions. Um, you know, the biggest, um, one of the biggest ways we hurt ourselves is by keeping all of this bottled in. And that's not a tricky value. That's not tricky way. This is something we learned. Um, you know, that men aren't supposed to talk about their feelings, um, you know, and so it's a lot of times it's more acceptable for a man to punch a wall or, you know, scream out in profanity or, or do some of these things. That's more accepted than two men getting um, together, sitting down, 
you know, talking about their emotions and getting this stuff out. You don't even always have to have a resolution. It's just getting, you know, maybe it's a negative feeling or, or something we're going through or whatever, getting this stuff out, um, you know, and other people you'll find are willing to share the burden with you. And by getting this stuff out, connecting with other people, um, you know, it definitely lightens our load. And so, you know, we're able to stay in balance. Um, you know, our mental wellness, uh, you know, challenging ourselves daily. Uh, you know, for me, uh, mental wellness this day and age means putting down my phone, putting down Facebook, um, picking up a book. Um, rather, um, you know, I, I was able to, to see, um, you know, whenever I'm on Facebook arguing with somebody, you can tell that my balance is off. So that's one of the clear cut signs to me, um, you know, that I'm not in balance is if I'm um, picking a fight on Facebook or, you know, not helping, you know, um, somebody in, instead of being argumentative. Um, so uh, physical wellness, are, you know, are we getting the exercise needed? You know, because like I said, you know, we could be the smartest person in the room, but we need to have that stamina um, if we're going to, to get out there and, and accomplish our dreams. Um, social wellness. This one is tough, you know, especially right now during the pandemic, but it's very important for us to stay connected, stay connected to each other. Find ways, um, you know, I know a lot of our organizations um, have weekly meetings um, for their, their members to check in. I think this is a great idea. So if you have an opportunity, um, you know, or if you need help um, organizing, um, you know, a, a Zoom talking circle, I think, uh, you know, uh, reach out to me or, you know, reach out to our department, uh, you know, because I think this is a great way for us to, um, to help each other. And like I said, you don't always even need resolution if you're going through something in, in your life. You just need to know somebody's there for you and that you have somebody to talk to. It makes all the difference in the world. Uh, respect for self, others, and environment. Um, you know, for me, respect for self means taking care of my body, uh, you know, making sure I'm, I've had to cut out, you know, a lot of, um, you know, grease and sugar and and all of these things, um, you know, I have to drink this stuff now, flavored carbonated mineral water, no sugar, no anything. And uh, it took some getting used to, uh, I couldn't stand it at first. But you know, I do these things because, you know, I have respect for my body. I have respect for myself, I, you know, and so, you know, I'm making sure that I'm also getting enough sleep. And then, um, you know, for me, respect for self, one of the biggest things means um, not holding on to resentment. That was one of the biggest things I did in my life. I feel like that held me back because when I had these resentments against people, they didn't know because I wasn't telling them and they didn't care. They were going on about their lives. And, but here I was in all of these resentments and negative emotions and jealousy and all of this stuff was really holding me back and holding me down. And so, um, by letting those things go. And like I said, you know, I have a, a program that I follow now that starts with praying in the morning. Um, you know, I pray when I'm braiding my hair. Um, I pray before each of my meals. I pray at night. And so, um, you know, one of the things I pray for is, you know, to let go of these resentments. Um, you know, another good way is to journal, um, you know, because we're going to get mad. Somebody's going to cut you off in traffic. You know, somebody's going to, um, you know, do this or that to you. Um, you know, it's going to put you in a bad mood. It's going to hurt your feelings. And, you know, that's just part of life. Um, you know, but it really, it, what matters is how we deal with those things. And by, by letting go of our resentments and letting go all of that stuff, it just helps us to be cleaner inside and helps us to be more in balance. Um, also for others, you know, one of the biggest things we're asked to do right now is wear a mask, um, you know, and, and these kind of things, you know, I, I do for other people, you know, you don't do it for yourself. Um, you know, you do it to make sure you're keeping your germs to yourself. So that, you know, that elder or, you know, that child out there, say if you are sick, you're not getting them sick, you know, and things like that, um, you know, listening to other people, that's a big one. Uh, for me, you know, I had to really work on active listening. I never noticed whenever I was listening to people that I was really just waiting to talk. And so I'd get a really good idea in my head or that maybe they would trigger a memory in me. And so now I really work on, if somebody's talking to me, I just really work on seeing and listening because um, it does show respect. I show respect for, you know, whatever you're trying to share with me. 
And, um, you know, respect for myself also because it helps me to take in. You know, say if I'm speaking to an elder or something and there's something I really need to learn, you know, it's just really good practice, you know, that um, you're able to, to listen instead of thinking about yourself. Um, that way you're able to take in all of that knowledge. And then respect for our environment. You know, one of the things we see right now, it's hunting season. Um, you know, I hear it all around my house. Um, you know, I'm out walking my dogs and I hear shots. And, um, you know, so, you know, when these hunters are out there, you know, we got to make sure, you know, if we are taking from the environment, if we are harvesting deer or harvesting crops or, you know, um, cutting wood or doing these things, taking, um, you know, part of some of these blessings that the creator has, has allowed us to have. We have to make sure we're giving thanks. You know, I know whenever, um, you know, we go out in California, we go out to gather sage, but here we go out and, you know, to gather cedar um, to use when we pray. Um, you know, we leave water, you know, dump water onto that plant, you know, that we're, we're asking that from, um, leave tobacco, uh, you know, and, and just that creates balance also, you know, whenever we, we are able to harvest these things. You know, um, you know, maybe putting apples out, you know, for, for other deer to eat. Um, whatever it is, you know, make sure that we're giving thanks for the things that we're blessed for um, when we are able to harvest these things. But then, you know, make sure that we are giving back to the environment. That shows respect. Um, integrity is a big one. This is, really helps me to stay in balance. Um, you know, by one, not doing anything that is going to harm others you know, put others in jeopardy um, and not doing anything um, I'm going to have to apologize for later. So that's how I try to live my life. It doesn't always work. I make mistakes. But when I do make those mistakes, I hurt, you know, say I inadvertently hurt somebody's feelings or, or whatever it was, making sure I apologize for that. Um, I believe that's really important um, is to be able to admit your mistakes. That is a true sign of leadership, um, you know, because people can see they know you made the mistake. And so by not admitting it, you just make yourself, you know, look crazy, you know, and that's not our way. That's not Cherokee way. You know, when we, we make a mistake, we own up to it. And, um, you know, it really helps people believe in us because they see us and say, you know, oh, he made this mistake, but he owned up to it. And he, this is how he said he's going to fix it. And this is what we're going to do in the future. You know, that gives you legitimacy also and, and helps people believe in you. You know, I've had people mention that to me that it was actually some of my mistakes that helped them learn the most because I owned up to it, you know, and I talked about, um, you know, what the resolution was going to be. And, you know, I was really open about it. And um, that, that really helped them um, work through some of their own stuff. And then um, lastly, service to others. Um, you know, all of you already do this. You guys are out there, um, like I said, you know, on a daily basis, helping each other. Um, and, you know, you, you do it without, um, I'm sure for every one thing we see on social media, you guys do, you guys do 99 that we don't see uh, where you're helping people out and selflessly, you know, uh, giving to, to other people. And so um, that's just really awesome to see, you know, that all of these things, uh, you know, are still alive and well in our people through all of the adversity we faced and all the bad things we've gone through. That is what makes us successful as a people is that we have these things and we continue to practice them to this day. So Cherokee culture teaches us um, how to walk in balance, you know, and these are some of the, the um, activities Cherokee culture um, comes from, you know, and, and where the teachings come from. Stomp dance, um, other ceremonies, gathering and making medicine, stickball and other games, uh, learning speaking Cherokee, art, storytelling, hunting and gathering, and our relationships. And this is not an all-inclusive list, uh, you know, of our culture, but this is a big part of it, you know, I believe. And this, these are some of the biggest things that have influenced how I live my life, what values I learned, um, you know, and, and what cultural teachings were able to help me, um, you know, when I did decide to step up and take a leadership role and be vocal um, with some of the things that I've learned. So these aspects of Cherokee life provide a program for wellness. If cultural teachings are followed, Cherokees will live a fulfilled life of wellness and be able to walk in balance. By walking in balance, servant leaders will have legitimacy and be trusted in their stewardship. So, you know, we talked about from pre-contact, post-contact, you know, how we've able to, been able to, our people have been able to survive 
all this adversity and these horrible things that, you know, been thrown in our path. Um, and it's because we, we strive to walk in balance. You know, our servant leaders, are, are, we hold them to a high standard. We ask a lot of them. And so, you know, if you want to be a leader or you're in a leadership role now, you know, what can you do to, one, to walk in balance, um, and two, to, to strengthen those leadership skills that you already have? And this is how you do it right now. By participating in our, our stomp dances, uh, you know, I know many of our people are at large and you don't get an opportunity, but it is worth it if you, um, you know, get a chance, of course, when, you know, once the pandemic, um, you know, is over, uh, come out, you know, reach out to me, reach out to some of these other people that you have on social media, make a plan, you know, for you and some of your other Cherokee community organization uh, members, make a plan to come out and, and be a part of the dancing. It's, um, you know, you will learn a lot and uh, you will be welcome. That's one of the biggest things I want to impress upon you about our ceremonies and about our dances is everyone was welcome. I remember growing up, um, we would always see people we didn't know at our stomp ground. That was just part of it. Um, you know, I mean, I remember once a bus pulled up and our, we were just getting ready to dance. It was like 10 o'clock at night. There was a bus of people that were driving from Missouri to somewhere and they'd gotten lost. And so they were ended up way out in the middle of nowhere. And there was like 20 people on this bus or something. And, um, you know, the, you know, our, um, the, our members at our stomp ground took them off the bus and fed them and, uh, you know, helped them get directions. And, you know, they stayed actually for a while, helped them get on the way and go on. And so, uh, you know, it's just, that's just one example of, you know, people really being welcomed, um, you know, at our, at, at our stomp grounds and, you know, at our ceremony. So, um, you know, gathering and making medicine. So, you know, it doesn't have to be, uh, you know, exactly going to a, a medicine person or going to somebody who practices medicine. It could be as simple as saying a prayer, burning some cedar. That's making medicine also. And so, um, you know, by, by doing these things, uh, you know, it helps us continue to practice the values that we've learned in, in Turkey culture and um, reinforce them in our lives. Uh, stickball and other games. Uh, learning and speaking Cherokee, art, storytelling, all of these things, um, we learn these values because of, you know, like I said, you know, when we play stickball, you know, one of the things we're taught is, you know, we're out there laughing playing stickball. Um, you know, I've seen my cousin, she got her nose broken, uh, my cousin Felicia, and she laughed it off, um, and um, I couldn't believe it. She was back out there playing and laughing, and, you know, um, that just goes to show one of the things we're taught, we don't get mad at each other. You know, of course it was an accident, but um, you know, to be, to be so grateful that we're out, out there and you know, um, I was always told it makes the creator happy to see us out there happy, laughing with one another, playing these games, um, you know, learning and speaking Cherokee, you know, doing art. You know, I just the other day, one of the things I heard about art was, don't let the fact that you're not good at it, um, you know, shy you away from doing it and you know that's one of the things you know I really always thought I was like you know oh do you do this I'm like no I'm not any good at it but that's besides the point you know take part in these things you know even if you're not good at it um, you know because when you we make these things we make baskets or, or you know you make art you know you we are, we are taught to have good thoughts while we're doing it and you know because you put your good thoughts you know, into that, whatever you're working on, you know, just like when you're cooking, you know, um, you know, you're, you're putting, you know, your good thoughts into that. And that's, that helps us stay in balance, you know, throughout the day, all of these activities, it's just making us, you refocus, refocus, um, you know, and, and be grateful for everything that we have. And after a while, it just starts to be, become a part of who you are. Um, hunting and gathering, that's another one, you know, um, to reinforce our, our gratitude our respect, um, and then our relationships. Uh, this is a big part of Cherokee culture. Um, you know, I remember, you know, um, whenever I was younger, uh, not everybody even had a TV, you know, and whenever we'd go to visit somebody's house, you know, they'd offer you coffee, offer you something, you know, to eat, and their TV went off. You never talked to somebody with your TV on, um, you know, and I'd sit there and I would listen for hours. You know, they would talk and talk. 
And I learned so much by listening to them talk. But it was just, you know, it's just an awesome part of our culture, you know, to see and con continue, to, you know, to this day. Uh, and so, you know, our relationships are, are vitally important, you know, and we are really um, lucky that we have this online technology now to where we can still continue to reach out um, to one another, uh, even though we're asked to be uh, physically different, distant during this time. So if, the, if our cultural teachings are followed, Cherokees will live a fulfilled life of wellness and be able to walk in balance. By walking in balance, servant leaders will have legitimacy and will be trusted in their stewardship. So, you know, one of the things um, I think is really important is to just acknowledge, you know, all everything that our ancestors, all the sacrifices they made so that we could have these things here. Uh, you know, it's just, I'm so thankful, you know, that. And then I'm also thankful to those in our community who continue to perpetuate this to this day. You know, um, um, if whether they're storytellers or they're leaders at the stomp ground or you know, um, leaders on our stickball fields or our, our language speakers. You know, it's just really awesome to see everybody getting out there, but not just getting out there, teaching others. And so, you know, if we're going to be leaders, you know, in this next generation, it's very important that we get out there and we're practicing our culture, we're learning about our culture, and then we're, we're passing our culture on to the next generation. So um, one of the last things I want to talk about is um, barriers to success for our leadership. Um, we have to watch out for negativity, jealousy, fear of change, distrust, anxiety. Uh, and I know these because I went through them all. You know, like I told you, um, I've been negative. I've been jealous. I've um, had fear of change. I've been distrustful. Um, and I've acted in a way that made others distrust me. Um, <clears throat> and I live my life based, based on anxiety. And so, you know, anxiety is a, a big one in my life. It's always been a part of my life. And it's something that I continue to work on this day. That's why I, I work a program, you know, um, that's based in our Cherokee culture so that I can walk in balance, you know, because these things can take hold of you, uh, you know. And that's how you know you're out of balance if you're jealous of what somebody else has, if you're negative, you know. Um, and a lot of people are negative, you know, before they have that first cup of coffee, you know, then you drink some coffee and all the world looks different. But, um, you know, if you're negative all throughout the day, you know, that's a sign that we need to get back to our culture, get back to our people, get back to being grateful. And, um, you know, it, it would definitely help us in the long run. But like I said, anxiety, that's how I can tell if I'm out of balance is uh, my anxiety will start to creep back up. And so, uh, you know, these are just things to watch out for, um, you know, to, to help us, you know, um, you know, to let us know when we need to, to work on something um, in our life to, to get us back into balance. Uh, leadership pitfalls, uh, make sure, you know, when, we, when you're in that top position, you know, sometimes it's lonely. And I, I, I definitely know, uh, you know, it can be overwhelming at times. And so, but these are the things we have to make sure that's why we want to stay in balance. That's why we need to practice this, this program of walking in balance is that we can stay away from excessive criticism, leaving team members out, being too demanding, railroading or bullying others, and gossiping. Gossiping is a huge one. Um, you know, I've worked in several organizations and that just really tore the team apart. Um, you know, and you have to look at the, what's the root cause of this person who is spreading this gossip? They're not in balance. And so it's not, you know, anything wrong with this person. You know, um, I'm, I've been guilty of gossiping, you know. Um, and the reason I did it is I wasn't in balance. So it's just us continuing to work on each other. This is a lifelong process. And, um, you know, it's one I'm just really happy to share because the, I um, implement all of these things in my own life. And so, um, you know, I'm just really excited to share them so that, um, you know, when people do step up and you are ready for that leadership position. Um, you know, if we're practicing, you know, our Turkey culture to help us walk in balance, um, we're going to be ready to, to answer the call uh, when we are held accountable, you know, by our fellow tribal members. And they're asking us, well, what are you going to do about this? Or, you know, how are you going to make sure other people are being heard? We have the answers already because we practice these things. So, 
In conclusion, uh, Cherokee culture teaches us how to be good leaders and good people. If we learn about and participate in our culture, then we will have access to all of the tools needed to walk in balance and be successful leaders. The teachings that have been passed down to us are all that we need. If we follow our teachings and perpetuate our culture, then our success as a people is guaranteed. And how do I know that's true? I know it's true because I've seen everything our past leaders have had to go through. And yet we're still here and um, our people are still together. Uh, our culture is intact. Our language is intact um, and is coming back. And so the reason all of that happened is because, you know, like I said, you know, our, our leaders walked in balance and they were servant leaders. They lived to serve. So if you want to learn about something, then ask myself or others. Also, if you are asked about something, then take that opportunity to teach because it is together that we will be able to move forward. Um, you know, and I think uh, this is one of the biggest ones. Um, you know, I was told by um, the language director, our Cherokee language director a while back, it doesn't matter how many Cherokee speakers you have, you can only count those speakers who are willing to teach others. And so, you know, um, let's make sure every opportunity we get, if somebody, you know, asks for, you know, guidance, then let's make sure we're there to guide. But also, if you guys want to learn about Cherokee culture, want to learn about something, I know it's um, intimidating sometimes, especially for me it was, you know, because I was like, well, I should already know this. And I felt bad and I let it make me feel bad about myself. But it's not, you know, we've had a ton of things throw at us thrown at us as a people. And if I don't know every single thing right now, that's kind of to be expected. And But what's really awesome is those answers are out there. There are people with that knowledge um, who are willing to help. And, you know, this Cherokee culture, the Cherokee language, it belongs to us all. So, you know, let's make sure we're taking that healthy risk, um, you know, to ask the questions, get the help that we need, and then help others. Uh, we'll do it for your time, everybody. Um, I appreciate it. And uh, I, I hope this has helped a little bit and uh, i hope you have a great day oh abraham yes oh we actually have a couple of questions if you want to. okay yeah um let's see there was one i think yeah okay um this came in on the q a it says hi i am a cherokee hoping to relocate from at large to the reservation to practice medicine in the next few years i struggle because while i wish to help others and serve others doctors are given so much power that i have seen that i've seen go unchecked how do those given power open themselves up to accountability is the first question and then and make sure we are always serving others and not ourselves yeah, I'm, those are great questions. Yeah. Um, and I think the one of the biggest ways that we open ourselves up, you know, to be accountable is to trust in our own strength. And we trust in our own strength when we are living by, you know, our culture and, you know, these set of guidelines. And not everybody's going to do it. You know, um, in other cultures, um, you know, American culture, um, you know, and, and other other cultures, they have their own set of values, their, their own things that they live by. But for Cherokee people, um, this is what is expected of us. And so, um, you know, we can't, you know, expect it of other people who, who aren't Cherokee, who aren't practicing their culture and these things. But for, for ourselves, I see it. Um, if somebody is working a good program of, of, you know, and being involved in their culture, that strength is there. And so if you're in balance, you're able, I'm like right now, you know, when I'm in balance, I'm able to accept criticism. I'm able to accept help, you know, and I make sure that I'm accountable on a daily basis. Um, you know, I commend you for, for coming back here uh, to practice medicine. I think that is a great calling, um, you know, and I, I think it's really selfless. And um, so by coming back and being involved in our culture, uh, listening to, um, you know, our fellow tribal members, um, you know, and, and taking into account what they need, um, I think is extremely important, you know, because you're just one person. But, you know, whenever, you know, I can't figure everything out. But whenever I get Donnie's input, I get Kevin's input, I get input from the rest of the CCO team. Um, it makes me, you know, so much more effective because I'm able to draw on all of the experiences of those around me. So I hope that helps. Okay, and one more here. 
uh, how do we approach non-natives that know more or have studied our culture um, or are more sacred than we are? <laughs> I've run into this, um, you know, several times. Uh, I've lived, uh, you know, all throughout the country and I've gone to college in a couple places and, you know, I've run into people who wanted to tell me about my own culture or, you know, who um, felt like they knew more and maybe they did know more. And, you know, one of the things I just look back on now is that, you know, just listen to them. Maybe they do have something to add, you know, and um, before I would get into arguments with them, you know, and it really didn't serve um, any greater purpose. So what I would say right now is you never know that creator might put that person right there in your path in that particular moment for you to learn a thing or two, whatever it is. And, um, you know, I'm also um, blessed, you know, excited that there are other people who want to learn about our culture. Uh, you know, that's, that's a really, um, it's really awesome to see. And so um, I, I think that's the biggest thing I will say is, you know, we don't have to be antagonistic. Um, you know, if somebody, you know, but if they are being antagonistic towards you, you know, listen to what they got to say and move right along, you know, separate yourself from them. Um, you know, but like I said, you know, make sure there isn't something that, you know, you can learn from them if they're being respectful and everything like that. But if not, I just, you know, I always just say, you know, thank you. I appreciate it. And I move on with my day. Okay. Wado Abraham, I think that's all the questions. It was a great presentation. And there are comments in the chat saying Wado and uh, uh, that they enjoyed it. And uh, so, yeah, lots of thank yous coming. So, and then, um, so for everybody watching right now, next Thursday, right, Donnie? Yes. Yes, okay. next Thursday we will have the um, legislative update again with Kim Teehee, our, uh, our proposed delegate to the U.S. Congress, and she's also our, our executive director of um, government relations at the Cherokee Nation. So that will be next Thursday, and then the following Thursday will be Lindy Conover on um, a capacity building uh, topic for our, our communities on um, moving from the CNCA um, uh, organization that we had under the Cherokee Nation for some time to the executive order under um, Chief Hoskin on um, uh, how to move forward and uh, with your organization and build capacity and think about becoming an official nonprofit. So we're, so anyway, in the next, every Thursday for the next five months now, uh, we're going to have something, and they are all going to be at 11 a.m. Central Time, uh, and then we'll have a special message from the chief uh, Christmas Eve, and then we will go back to culture. So Sounds Abraham good. and I will be presenting on the culture. So that's what's happening. So everybody, I, I look forward to seeing you all next Thursday. Uh, Wado Donnie and Wado everybody for joining us today. I really appreciate it. Bye-bye.